Well, I trust everybody had a good Christmas time with yes. everybody around, all that's going on, presence of the Lord. It's almost New Year's. Everybody gets wrapped up about New Year's. At least some do. At least they sell a lot of confetti and booze during this time of the year. A lot goes on. Thank you, sir. It's almost time for those New Year's resolutions. No. How many have already got something in mind that's a resolution for the New Year? Please don't raise your hand. <laughs> because all that is is something you ain't going to do. You know what I'm saying? If it's important enough to you, and it's something you feel like you need to do, why do you have to wait till New Year's to do it? What's wrong with today? Today is the day of salvation. Amen. Lots of folks will hang on and say, I've got just a few more days before I've got to start changing that. Come the first of the year, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not going to be like that anymore. I'm not going to act like that anymore. I'm not going to eat like that anymore. I'm not going to do whatever it is that the Lord is prompting your spirit about that you need to do something with. Well, I've got two more days. The Lord, as we spoke earlier, is coming. Amen. No one knows the day or the hour. We know that it's in a moment in the twinkling of an eye that the trumpet will sound and things will happen. Thank you, Jesus. What time is it right now, Ken? Eleven oh five. So see, there's still roughly 13 or 12 hours and 55, maybe 54 now minutes left in this day that the Lord could come in. Not to count tomorrow or the next day. The New Year's thing is a <clears throat> It's what we need to do today. Amen. See, the Lord could call all of us that are ready. The Lord could call us individually before New Year's. I'm going to read a scripture here. If you will bear with me for just a little bit, I'm going to read quite a little scripture. And I don't want to put it on the board, please. Because I want everybody to follow with me. John 14, 1 through 3. This will be from the New King James today. Let not your hearts be troubled. A lot of things going on in this world that makes everybody a little anxious. 
for the child of God. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. A hope right there of what's coming for us. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, this morning, may our hearts be opened. May our minds be keen on what you have to say. May your spirit reveal to us things in our lives and things that are going on and things that we need to do and what your word says to us. Not just something we have heard over and over and over, but there is reality and there is life in your words. And there is blood to back your words. Blood you gave on Calvary's tree. This day, Lord, quicken our hearts and our lives. May we be ready to stand before you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise you, Jesus. I love the Christmas time season, always have. I look at all this stuff hanging around in here that brings to mind the Christmas season. We have done our share to support the commercial end of Christmas. And it's beautiful. And I don't care if we don't take it down till Valentine's Day. Um, probably won't happen, but uh, I'll get outvoted. But I could stand it a couple more weeks. It's beautiful. Amen. It's peaceful. It brings to mind a very great time of the year for us as children of God. But that Jesus that came is going to come again. And he has been preparing for us a place to dwell with him forever. And I don't care what you live in or don't live in or what it is. There is nothing on this earth that can compare. To what God has prepared for his people. Amen. First Corinthians chapter 4. I'm going to read some verses. This is from the letter from Paul to the church at Corinth, to the Corinthians. And he is speaking here of himself and Apollos. When he says, let a man so consider us. Apollos and I, as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required in stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by a human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself. For I know of nothing against myself. That's quite a statement for a man to be able to make that feels that he strives so hard that he is so concerned about his walk with God. And he tries to stay on top of himself best he can. And that he goes to the Lord every day and asks forgiveness and asks for direction in his life and asks for a Christ-likeness that he does not know of anything that would keep him from God. Amen. Quite a place to be. Quite a place to be. 
I won't ask where we measure up. For I know of nothing against myself, yet I am not justified by this. But he who judges me is the Lord. Therefore judge nothing before the time until the Lord comes, who will both bring to light the hidden things of darkness and reveal the counsels of the hearts. Then each one's praise will come from God. That we must be found faithful. Not a lot needs to be said with that. That we must be found faithful. And nobody in this place today, best I can look around and see, needs to ask me what that means. We know what being faithful to God means. Where are we there? I want to read another little story. I'm going to take a little bit of time and read this. This is Daniel chapter 5, also from the New King James. Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple which had been in Jerusalem. That the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines might drink from them. No consideration for the things of God. No thought about what the things that belong to God and to his temple meant. They're mine now. My father took them. He's gone. I'm here. Bring all them gold and silver goblets in here and all of this host of drunks is going to drink from those. And my pride and who I am and what I think should happen and my consideration of myself is all that matters right now. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives, his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold, silver, bronze, and iron, wood, and stone. They praised the things made of man. They praised the things God made out of, that man made out of things here, out of what God had made, what God created. There was no consideration of anything but themselves and what's within them and what's important, the things of this earth. And they drank from them with no thought of what they were. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Now, here's a man that people live or die at his word. Things are done or not done at his word. He is a dictator. He is the king. His pride has consumed him. Who he is and what he is and what he can do and what he can have at his word has consumed him. 
things of this earth can consume us. And this man sees a hand appear and the finger starts writing on the wall. I got to quit drinking so much. You think he thought that? And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then the king's countenance changed. Do tell. The pride, the arrogance, the who I am. I'm so special. All of a sudden there's a hand writing with the finger on the wall things I can't understand. I can imagine he felt this sensation go over him. And I'm sure he got hot and he started sweating. And the hair stood up on the back of his neck. And there's something there that's not something he's accustomed to. And his thoughts troubled him so that the joints of his hips were loosened and his knees knocked against each other. I'm not such a big dude after all. The king cried aloud. You can hear him. I can hear that guy. Glass shaking, slopping his wine, rattling the gold goblet on the table. Bring the astrologers! Get them sorry hides in here now! And that they were. Bring the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers. Now who's going to be on the hot seat? The king spoke, saying to the wise men of Babylon, Whoever reads this writing and tells me its interpretation shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around his neck, and he shall be the third ruler in the kingdom. That's what was important to a man then. To wear a purple robe and have a gold chain around his neck. That was supposed to mean something. No count of God. What man sees as important. What man sees as a step up. A gold robe and a purple chain. Myself, I don't want a gold robe. I don't think I'd look too good in a gold robe and a purple chain and a cowboy hat. (laughs) Third kingdom ruler or not, who cares? Now all the king's wise men came. And I imagine it was reluctantly. Dude, we don't know nothing. We've just been snowballing everybody all this time. But they could not read the writing or make known to the king its interpretation. Then King Belshazzar was greatly troubled, as if he wasn't troubled already. His countenance was changed even more.
Yeah, you better believe it. And his lords were astonished. We're not whooping and hollering and telling anybody to get a glass and fill it up anymore. All that means nothing. Because there's something written by hand on the wall that nobody can explain. Because the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords had been there. And old King Belshazzar was nothing. Where are we? Then the queen, because of the words of the king and his lords, came to the banquet hall. The queen spoke, saying, O king, live forever. <laughs> Waste of breath. Do not let your thoughts trouble you, nor let your countenance change. There is a man in your kingdom in whom is the spirit of the holy God. Strange she should say that in a godless kingdom. And in the days of your father, light and understanding and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods, there she messed up, were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father, the king, made him chief of the magicians, the astrologers, the Chaldeans, and the soothsayers, inasmuch as an excellent spirit, knowledge, understanding, and interpreting dreams, solving riddles, and explaining enigmas was found in this Daniel, whom the king named Belteshazzar. Now let Daniel be called, and he will give the interpretation, even to the world. If you have the Spirit of God in you, and if you live the life as Daniel did, as Paul and Apollos and many tried so hard to do, the world will see in you that spirit says so right there. Amen. In a godless, wicked kingdom that worshipped everything but God, this lady knew that this man had the spirit of the living God. We don't have a living God because we choose not to. But he has a living God. And that living God and that spirit of God in him produces a spirit in him that is so excellent. But we don't want none of that. That's what them words tell you right there. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. The king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you the Daniel? who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father, the king, brought from Judah. I have heard of you, that the Spirit of God is in you. An acknowledgement that the Spirit of God is real and exists in a man. But that don't work for me, because I'm the king. How does it work for us? I have heard of you that the Spirit of God is in you and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. Now the wise men, the astrologers that I have brought in before me, that they should read the writing and make known to me its interpretation but they could not give me the interpretation of the thing. And I have heard of you that you can give interpretations and explain enigmas. 
Now, if you can read this writing and make known to me its interpretation, guess what? I'll give you a purple robe and I'll give you a gold chain around your neck and I'll make you the third ruler of the kingdom, which don't mean anything. And you can go to Walmart and buy your own purple robe. Maybe not a gold chain. But it's the same old thing from the same old spirit that comes from Satan. That material things and position and power are what's important. And I will do that for you simply because I sat in this chair and have the right to because I sat in this chair. And when your come, time comes to die, maybe they can wrap you up in it and bury you in it and it'll all be good. That's about what it's worth. Now, if you can read the thing and make known to me its interpretation, you shall be clothed with purple and have a chain of gold around your neck and shall be third ruler in the kingdom. This next line I love. It is not the way of man. It is the way of God. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself. I don't need your purple robe. I don't want your purple robe. I don't want your gold necklace. And I don't want to be third in the kingdom. I serve God. And that's why I'm here. Is because God will give what purple robes and gold necklaces and position and a name won't give. That's what it says. And give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king. And make known to the king the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar, your father, a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. God gave it to him. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Whomever he wished, he set up, and whomever he wished, he put down. But when his heart was lifted up, pride. And his spirit was hardened in pride. He was disposed from the kingly throne. And they took his glory from him. Then he was driven from the sons of men, from people... His heart was made like the beasts, and his dwelling was with the wild donkeys. They fed him with grass like oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven. Now, that's a little pride check there. This is a man that his word was the final word. That's kicked out in the pasture. And he crawled on his hands and knees. And he ate grass. And he ate whatever there was. Like the animals did for food. And the people saw him brought down. And he did that. And he lived like that. Existed like that. Until the pride In him was broken till he humbled himself before God. And what God was about was what was important, not what Nebuchadnezzar was about. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. 
And he fed this, was fed with grass like the oxen, and his body was wet with the dew of heaven, till he knew that the Most High God rules in the kingdom of men and appoints over it whomever he chooses. But you, his son, Belshazzar, have not humbled your heart, although you knew all this, and you have lifted yourself against the Lord of heaven. They have brought the vessels of his, the Lord's house, before you, and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk wine from them. And yet you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which do not see or hear or know. It's real easy for us to get in that spot. It's real easy to get in a spot of thinking we're something special, thinking we have it in control thinking we don't need anybody. But we do keep God on the 911 speed dial when it is out of our control, don't we? These gods do not see or hear or know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways you have not glorified my great grandpa Payne used to say that breath man that's the main thing I've heard him read this and that's what he'd say every time that breath man that's the main thing And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. Then the finger of the hand, fingers of the hand were sent from him. The God, God you would not glorify. And this writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written. And I have no idea how you say these words. How many have read it? Yes, you have. Mene, Mene, Tekel, a person. On the wall. By the hand of God. Then Daniel said, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. That's what Mene meant. Tekel, you have been weighed in the balanced and have been found wanting. You have been weighed in the balance and have been found wanting. Man, it's quiet. And the rest. Your kingdom, the last word has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar, the old proud king that's going to do it his way, gave the command and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler of the kingdom. And I can see Daniel standing there going. Mm. 
that very night, Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, was slain. Purple robe didn't get it done. Gold chain didn't get it done. Making him third ruler of the kingdom didn't get it done. His pride and his arrogance and his godlessness and his no desire to know the God, the true spirit of God, when he knew it existed. Brought him to an end. And Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. Who, because of his own proclamation, had to throw Daniel in the lion's den. What's his name? Darius. And who was it that after he had done that, hated so bad that he had to do that by his own word? Ran in the morning. And what did he say? Daniel, Daniel, has the God you serve been able to save you. O oh, king, live forever, is what he heard. It says we must be found faithful. And we can't be found wanting. What does that mean? That the Jesus who came at this time as a baby paid a price of his blood on Calvary's tree. Came knowing that that's what would happen. Came in a miraculous way. Grew up like we did. Dealt with things just like we do says he wasn't always tempted as we are, always tempted as we are, yet without sin. He was obedient to the Father, to death. And he says, we must be faithful as he was faithful. We must not be found wanting as he was not found wanting. Don't even think about a New Year's resolution. Think about where you stand with God. Jesus is coming in the clouds of glory. Will we be found faithful? Will we be found not wanting? Will we be doing as Paul said and he alluded to in those scriptures, I don't know of anything that would judge me that I would lose out. They were living the life to the best of their ability. That's what we need to do every day, starting from this second forward. As we said earlier, we might not make New Year's. Think about today. Think about where you are today. Many times we sit in a chair every Sunday and there's things we need to deal with. And there's not anybody in here. I keep saying it and I keep saying it because I feel like... I feel like... It is so important. I feel like it is so upon us that we all have somebody that we'd love to see in heaven. Where are they today? 
Where were they last Sunday? Where were they the Sunday before that, the month before that, the year before that? You might say, man, you're getting a little hard. Hey, dude, that's how it is. We just have to go to the round pen once in a while. There are people we know that we call friends, and I keep saying it, and I'm going to keep saying it because it's so important that we call friends that are not ready to meet the Lord, and we know that. That's not being judgmental. We know that. What are we doing about that? Amen. Well, it's just comfortable to just come to church and sit in the pew and sing a few songs and let them know I go to church. Yeah, that's a good witness that you're faithful. If you're faithful to the Lord's house, that's a great witness. But it takes straight on. Build that relationship. Most of you got friends. You've already got that relationship. Enough said. Could I have the music, please? Praise you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. Last Sunday service, last service, if the Lord tarries of this year. You want some advice from a guy they call a preacher? I don't think I'm much of a preacher myself. Don't worry about the weight you gained over the holidays. <laughs> don't worry about all these things that you just feel like are just things that just have to happen in this world and got to do it. I'll bet if you start worrying about God's business that he'll help you make a lot of them other things happen. Put your priorities right. Yes, amen. Fill this place with people that need Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. They're all around us every day. People that need the Lord. Love them. Let them know how important it is to you. Show them a life that they want. Not a life that they're like, whoo, I'm going to be like them. I don't want nothing to do with that. Love them. Make sure they know Jesus died for them and he loves them too. Praise God. Next words are, thy word declares. Praise you, Jesus. Thy word declares what we can have in Jesus. What we can be in Jesus. We can be faithful. And we can be in a position to not be found wanting. Or in other words, just hanging out there and not getting her done. And that we have not been for the Lord what we should have been. Praise you, Jesus. Well, every head is bowed. Everybody's praying.